Okay, well, thank you, uh, everyone, for showing up on the last morning of the conference. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is talk about one recent challenge to the philosophical notion of defeat, uh, which arises from trying to fit it in within a, into a Bayesian formal framework. Um, as we'll see, that's just, just one of a range of recent challenges to defeat, uh, but that's the one I'm going to focus on today. Um, so just for those who don't know, I guess, I mean, the sort of connection with the conference is that I think the notion that uh, justification or knowledge can be defeated is, if you like, a reflection of uh, both our fallibility and our appropriate intellectual humility, right? So the rough thought is that you might start out by uh, knowing something or having a justified belief, and then some further evidence might come in, and as a result of that, it seems that you ought to revise your belief because it's no longer justified on knowledge. Uh, so, for example, um, <laughs> Suppose somebody tells me, um, and I've got no reason to disbelieve them, that it takes an hour to get off the island. Uh, and then someone who appears to be local and have no reason to distrust them says, oh no, it's going to be an hour and a half. Well, even if the first thing was right, and so I did initially acquire knowledge, it seems that I ought to you know, reduce my credence after hearing the contrary testimony. So that's sort of what defeat's all about. Um, and it's long been a philosophical orthodoxy that uh, evidence can defeat justification of knowledge in this way. But there are a range of recent attacks on the notion of defeat, and I'm particularly going to concentrate on one attack on a notion of what I'll call revisionary defeat. Um, and I'm going to argue uh, against that by saying this kind of attack would extend problematically to what I'll call contributory defeat, and so we should reject these attacks. I'll be introducing the terms revisionary and contributory in a minute. Um, but just to give some broader background to the talk, I'm, as I say, I'm going to focus on the idea that it's difficult to fit defeat into a formal Bayesian framework, but that's just one of perhaps four different strands of attack on defeat which are current in the literature. Uh, another main strand is it's hard to fit defeat into naturalistic or externalist accounts of uh, justification knowledge. Uh, a third theme is that perhaps some of the reasons people thought defeat was so useful uh, don't turn out to be so good after all, in particular that it's not so useful to deal with the sort of dogmatism paradox. Uh, and a fourth kind of theme is that this comes up and is that highly relevant to, or the notion of defeat is highly relevant to, the kind of debates about disagreement and how you ought to rationally respond to disagreement. Um, and one sort of idea would be that, um, you know, even if you've sort of reasoned incredibly well to your belief, but you get sort of contrary testimony from somebody else, uh, you might think, if you think that defeats your initial belief, then of course you should revise. So you could use defeat to kind of... Uh, back either a sort of conciliatory view or any view on which you should reduce credence in such situations. So, um, but of course, how one should respond to disagreement is a highly vexed issue, uh, and so that's also why some people might be uh, negative about defeat. So that's just all by way of overview. So here are just a couple of distinctions uh, it's useful for us to, to know about. The first one is a standard one that many people will be familiar with, um, whereas the second one is one I want to introduce. So the first distinction is between, well-known distinction between rebutting and undercutting defeat. There's two kinds of ways your belief could be defeated. So let's go back to the testimony case. So suppose one person A testifies to you that P, uh, A is highly reliable and you've got no reason to doubt that. Um, so it seems you could form a justified belief or perhaps even know something on the base, basis of A's testimony. We'll have a rebutting defeater for that if another testifier just says not P. So you've now got some direct evidence against the truth of your belief. There's one kind of defeater. And it seems that, you know, if there's no reason to go to choose between A or B, it does seem that your justification to believe or knowledge gets defeated in that case. On the other hand, a rebutting defeater doesn't really give you evidence that tells them the truth value of P, the thing you believe. It just says that wasn't a good, good basis for your belief or good source for your belief. So for example, A says, you know what, Jessica, P, and B says, uh, you know what, Jessica, A's just guessing, right? Or A's hopeless on stuff like this, right? So that would be an undercutting or undermining defeater. There's a variety of terminology in the literature, but that's a very standard distinction. I'm going to be more interested in this second distinction, which cross-cuts the first, and that's between what I'll call revisionary and contributory defeat. So I think actually that most accounts of defeat in the literature are assuming both these notions, but they don't explicitly distinguish them. Um, so the key difference is whether or not the defeat is functioning so as to revise or undermine an existing epistemic standing. Right? So that's the key difference between revisionary and contributory. 
So if we go back to the testimony case, suppose A testifies first that P, so you initially gain a justified belief or knowledge that P, and then later on, B comes in and either gives you contrary evidence or says, ah, just A is just guessing, and it looks as if B's evidence could defeat or undermine that existing epistemic status, so you lose your existing epistemic status. So that's a revisionary notion. Whereas a contributory notion, uh, no revision is involved, right? So in this case, we can imagine, as it were, that the um, two kinds of testimony come in at just the same time, or perhaps you get the undermining evidence before A's even spoken. So before A's spoken, B says, whatever A says about this matter, she's, she'll just be guessing, so don't trust her, right? And in that case, we don't need to talk about revision, it seems, because it looks as if you never got justification to believe from the testimony of A to start with, right? So it's not that you got that and then it was revised. It looks as if if you have the underminer first, then you never get justification to believe from A. So that's a sort of what I'll call contributory when no, it's a kind of defeat of a prima facie justification to believe when nothing's being revised. Okay. And later, you'll see me appealing to that distinction to um, rule out the denial of defeat in a certain kind of case, and the form of the argument will go, if you deny revisionary, you'll have to deny contributory. Nobody should deny contributory, so don't, don't deny the revisionary. That's the way the argument will go. And I take it that's plausible because, I mean, contributory, the notion of contributory defeat really is just a reflection of the fact that what you ought to believe depends on all of your evidence, and some of your evidence can kind of undermine the other evidence. And like that just seems such a plausible view that you just don't want to do without the contributory. And I do think it's notable that at least some of the recent attacks on defeat have been specifically targeted at revisionary. Um, people haven't actually talked about this distinction explicitly to my knowledge, um, but I think it's easy to think you'd have an argument against revisionary if you weren't also thinking, oh, but then how can I keep the contributory? So that will play a part in my argument. Um, okay, so the only thing really we need from this slide is um, I'm gonna talk about one kind of attack on the revisionary, this is part of a longer paper. So in the longer paper I talked about the dogmatism puzzle too, and we can talk about that in Q&A. That's also a sort of you know, recent attack on the revisionary is the idea that it can't solve the dogmatism puzzle. Uh, but I'm actually going to focus wholly on the worries arising from a Bayesian framework, uh, which are worries initially about a revisionary notion of defeat because the worry is, couldn't something lose its status as evidence? So that's loss of certain kind of epistemic status. So that's what I'll be focusing on. Okay, so here's the problem for uh, the Bayesian framework. Um, Intuitively, this, this, by the way, is a case that, um, uh, that I'm sort of borrowing from a very nice paper by uh, Dan Greco, uh, who, uh, whose work on this I found very uh, interesting, and uh, whose solution to this problem I'll be arguing against in part in, in this paper. Uh, so that's just to sort of credit Dan for, for this case. Um, so it looks as if intuitively evidence could be undermined. So something could be part of your evidence and then it could lose its status as evidence. And what we'll see is it's very hard to accommodate that within a formal Bayesian framework. I'll be focusing only on a classical Bayesian framework, but if you want to see that result extended to a Jeffrey-style conditionalization, uh, then um, Weisberg has a really nice paper on that. So that would be a place to look for the generalization. But let's sort of stick with the, the uh, simpler version of the problem. So suppose you learn, for example, from the newspaper that most union members intend to vote yes in the forthcoming strike ballot. So that seems to be part of your evidence once you learn that. Uh, and indeed, given certain plausible links between intentions and behavior, that gives you justification to believe the proposition I'm calling yes, that most of them will vote yes. Right? So that's our background assumption, then voting intentions are a good guide to behavior. So it seems that if that was like the end of the story, you'd have justification to believe that there will be a, a yes vote. Now that could be defeated in two different ways. The way that's kind of easy to accommodate within the Bayesian framework is um, the one that comes from this proposition announced. So suppose subsequently to getting this information about their voting intentions, you get the information that the employers are about to make an offer which will change voting intentions, right? Well, at that stage, it seems you no longer have justification to believe there'll be a yes vote, and it's really easy to put that within a Bayesian framework. Why is that? Because, you, as it were, you can, you can understand that on a cumulative model of evidence, right? So uh, intend is still part of your evidence. It's still true that they now intend to vote yes, and that's part of your information. And we can add the information, but the employers are about to make an offer which will change that. And we could, by adding this stuff together, we can see that you don't really have justification to believe there'll be a yes vote. So that's all fine. 
The difficulty is when we get uh, this second kind of uh, de feature, which I've called floor here. So suppose that instead of getting, forget all now all about announced, suppose instead of getting the information announced, you get the information floor, that the survey reported in the newspaper was flawed. So I take it that, you know, if your situation is that first you got the, you read in the newspaper that most union members intend to vote yes, um, and then later you're told, and that's your kind of only relevant information, and then later you're told the survey was flawed, then you don't have justification to believe there'll be yes vote. That got defeated. Right? And the question is how to model that in the Bayesian framework. Intuitively, we would like to say, well, after this information about flaw, it's no longer part of your evidence that most union members will vote yes. But that's to say that you lost some evidence. And in fact, a classical Bayesian framework doesn't allow for that. Right? That's the problem. Um, but if it is still part, if, and if intent is still part of your evidence, then it seems you would have justification to believe most union members will vote yes, even if we add the information of flaw. Right? Why is that? Well, the information that some survey was flawed doesn't actually undermine the general connection between intentions and behavior. Right? That's still in place. We know that intentions are a good guide to behavior. And so it's still part of your evidence, even after you've heard about the flaw, that most union members intend to vote yes, you still have justification to believe that there will be a yes vote. Um, so that's, that's the problem in a nutshell. Um, so this is just a sort of summary slide of the problem for Bayesianism. On a classical treatment, once a proposition is part of my evidence, it remains part of my evidence. And if that's so, then even adding the information about flaw to my information about their voting intentions leaves me with justification to believe there will be a yes vote because intentions are a good guide to behavior. Um, and just to say, I realized uh, when I was looking through the PowerPoint this morning that, um, well, you'll see in a minute, actually, I'll, I'll see it in a minute, that I'd forgotten to number certain propositions. I've got bullet points instead of numbers. This will be, I think, on the next slide. And then I realized as I paged through it, you, you'd lose that. And so you might want to have a sort of aid memoir. So this is the aid memoir uh, for the next slide. You'll see that I forgot to put the numbers on its bullet points. And then I keep referring to things like one and four, and you'll be like, what on earth are they, right? Uh, so this is a kind of aid memoir, um, and also once this goes off. So it looks as if we have a sort of paradox, right? We'd like a bunch of stuff all to be true. Um, but uh, so this is a bunch of claims that they, they're jointly, it seems, inconsistent. Some of them follow from assumptions of the, the formal framework. Some of them uh, seem natural things to say about the case. But they're inconsistent. And in particular, the first three claims are inconsistent with the defeat intuition, which is the last one. So this is our paradox. We started out with the thought, my evidence includes intent. In other words, that most members intend to vote yes. That was just from the description of the case. And then the sort of Bayesian assumption is, you know, you're not going to lose evidence. So if the first time my evidence includes this claim about voting intentions, then it will at subsequent times. The third claim is the thing I just went through, that if at the later time it's still part of your evidence that most uh, union members intend to vote yes, then I have justification to believe there will be a yes vote. That's just from the fact that intentions are a good guide to behavior. And even learning about the flaw in the survey doesn't show that intentions aren't a good guide to behavior, so that's still in place. But we want to say, after all this happens, I don't have justification to believe there'll be a yes vote. right? But that's an inconsistent set of propositions. So how are we going to uh, deal with that? Just very briefly, um, it's very hard. I mean, you might be tempted to think initially, well, perhaps Jessica misdescribed the evidence in the case. Perhaps it wasn't that most intend to vote yes, but rather some weaker claim like the newspaper reported that most intend to vote yes. This doesn't really get around the problem because, um, I mean, the, the general problem is whatever you take to be evidence isn't undeminable in this framework, right? I mean, that's the general version of the problem. So even if you shifted to something else, I could have given you a different case in which you had undermining uh, defeat for what you now took to be evidence or suggested was evidence instead, and we just run the whole thing again, right? So if you said, oh, no, Jessica, the evidence was a newspaper reported, then I'll say something. Then we reconstruct the case like this. The, the, the sort of undermining evidence you get is, um, no, 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 I don't recall that the newspaper said that, or you know, no, 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 Jessica, your evidence has been, your memory's been going a little recently, and I don't think that's what the newspaper said. And we just get, we just get another underminer, right? So that's not really going to be a solution. Um, I've also defended the third claim, uh, if intent is still part of your evidence, at a later time, then at a later time you've got justification to believe yeah, That just follows from intentions are a good guide to behavior, and the stuff about the survey being flawed didn't change that. So there's no point, I think, really looking at either one or three. Um, 
You could try and deny defeat, which I'll argue against in a minute. Um, so that's one thing I'll, the next thing I'll do is say you can't get rid of this problem by denying four. So that would only really leave two unless you can go for a contextualist solution, right? So we all know that one way to deal with sort of paradoxes is to go contextualist and say, ah, there's no real inconsistency here, it's just some unnoticed disk equivocation on some term. So I'll basically, after uh, defending the idea that we don't want to reject defeat, I'll contrast a contextualist solution and my own preferred solution, which is to deny that second claim, allow for loss of evidence. So that will be the structure uh, from now on. So one thing you might be tempted to do in the light of this problem is just go along with a sort of general trend that you see in the, quite a bit of the literature at the moment and just say, oh, let's just reject defeat, right? Notice that in this case, this is rejection of what I'm calling revisionary defeat, right? So the idea would be, yes, initially, it was part of your evidence that um, most union members intend to vote yes, but later on, that's no longer part of your evidence. So it's loss of a certain kind of epistemic standing, that a proposition is part of your evidence, right? So it's a revisionary notion of defeat. And my general reaction to attacks on revisionary defeat in the literature is that uh, they come with this too high cost, which is you need to reject the contributory. And whenever we have something of that, so whenever anybody says, you know, deny revisionary defeat, this is what you should do. Um, if it's a revisionary case, there'll be, um, as it were, your initial information state and a later information state, which is supposed to revise the initial epistemic standing. So if anybody ever says, no, we don't like that kind of thing, you want to turn it into a contributory case and say, your opponent has to deny the contributory, how do you do that? You collapse the time, right? So you don't want a diachronic case, you want a synchronic case. So our initial survey case was diachronic. Initially, I read in the paper, most intend to vote yes. It seems I've got justification to believe there'll be a yes vote. And then later on, somebody tells me, oh, no, 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 but that survey was flawed, right? So that's our original diachronic case. We can turn it into a synchronic case just by supposing that um, you get all the information at once or that you get the information about the flaw in the survey before you read the newspaper. So I take it that if before you read in the newspaper that most intend to vote yes, you get the information that the survey in which that was based was flawed, uh, you never had overall justification to believe there'll be a yes vote, right? And I take it that's just the right thing to think about that case. But I think if that's right, that puts pressure on the denial of revisionary defeat when the information does come in later, because surely just like the order in which the information comes in these cases shouldn't affect your overall final epistemic standing. Right? Um, so on that plausible claim, if you want to say deny the revisionary defeat, you've got to deny the contributory, but I said right at the beginning that looks really, really bad, right? I mean, it looks as if your justification should be affected by the evidence you have. Okay. So I think we shouldn't be um, denying defeat, so, as I said, one thing you might try and do here um, is uh, apply a general strategy of dealing with paradoxes, which is to say, oh, there was some unknown equivocation in setting up the paradox, and actually each claim is true in some context, but there's no context in which they're kind of all true, so we get rid of the inconsistency. So this kind of response has been um, suggested by Dan Greco in a really interesting paper on this topic. Um, and what he suggests is going on is that, in this case, the notion of evidence is changing its meaning. So we're more familiar with, perhaps, contextualist theories of knowledge on which the word knowledge changes its meaning, say, between an ordinary and a skeptical context. And Dan says, uh, you know, there are contextualist views about evidence in the literature, for example, Ram Nett has defended one. And Dan says, let's, let's try and appeal to a contextualist notion about evidence to deal with a puzzle. So the thought would be, and here this is where it's kind of useful to um, have the numbered propositions if you can read this. Um, so the thought would be that at the first time when I just read in the newspaper that um, most union members intend to vote yes, it's true, you'd have to go metalinguistic on all of these, right? But it'll be true for me to say that most intend to vote yes is part of my evidence. That's a true claim at the first time. The second and third claims um, will turn out to be true in any context, uh, but uh, as long as that context is fixed. So the second and third, second claim says, if at a time um, it's true for you to say something's part of your evidence, then at that time it's true for you to say that it will be part, later part of your evidence as well. And the third claim says, if at some time it's true for you to say something's part of your evidence, in particular if at the T2, it's true for you to say intense part of your evidence, then at that same time you've got justification to believe. 
Um, but the key thing in the, in the contextual solution will be the claim that even though at T1 it was true for you to claim this proposition as part of your evidence, by the second time, T2, after you got the information about the flaw, it's no longer true for you to say that, right? So the idea is there's a shift in the notion of evidence. Initially, it's true for you to say part of my evidence is most intent to vote yes. But at the later time, after the information about the, the flaw in the survey, the word evidence has changed its meaning so that it's no longer true for you to self-describe as evidence the claim most intent to vote yes. And if that's the case, then we sort of get a dissolution of the puzzle because even though uh, at the later time, so given at the later time, sorry, uh, it's not true for me to claim intent as part of my evidence, then even if intentions are a good guide to behavior, I don't get justification to believe they will vote yes. All right, so that would be the sort of contextual solution to the problem. As I put it here, each of the claims are plausible. The second and third claim are true in any fixed context. The first claim, which says that intent part of my evidence, is true at the first time. Uh, and that, but at the second time, that's no longer true, so that at the second time, it's no longer f true for me to claim uh, that I've got justification to believe uh, that there'll be a yes vote. So that's the contextualist solution. Now, many people might be worried about contextualism in general, right? There's lots and lots of worries about contextualism about knowledge. But here I want to highlight a couple of worries about this in particular. Um, and the first worry is that I think we ought to be distinguishing more carefully between defeat and doubt, right? I mean, roughly speaking, the mechanism that Dan's suggesting is, um, you know, it's well known that on contextualist views, uh, if somebody introduces some doubt, that could change the meaning of key epistemic terms so that uh, the truth value of key epistemic claims changes. So uh, in the knowledge case, the contextualist says, when the skeptic gets going, she introduces doubt. So the word knowledge changes its meaning so that it's no longer true for us to claim knowledge. That's a standard contextualist view. And Dan's kind of just doing the same thing, but about evidence, right? So his idea is that uh, when you get the information that the survey is flawed, that introduces psychological doubt, which changes the meaning of the word evidence, so it's no longer true for you to self-ascribe as evidence. Most intend to vote yes. That's the idea. But I just think it's a really bad idea to merge positive reason to doubt from psychological doubt. I mean, when the skeptic says, oh, but maybe you're obeying the vat, she hasn't given you positive reason to think you're obeying the vat. She's just introduced this possibility. And that might well lead to psychological doubt. But psychological doubt is not the same thing as evidence to suppose something went wrong. We need to clearly distinguish those two things. Right? So, you know, for example, suppose later on we're you know, trying to get back to LAX and um, uh, somebody says, oh, but maybe it'll take longer or something. Well, it's like, well, maybe it will, maybe it won't, but that's quite different epistemically from, but here's some evidence there's a huge traffic jam on the freeway we'll have to take, and so here's some evidence that you won't get there in the relevant time. We really, it seems to me, ought to distinguish defeat and doubt, um, and we don't want to just put those two things together. Um, so here's, a, here's another sort of way of putting that point. Um, it seems to me that ungrounded psychological doubt, like skeptical doubt, should kind of effect, have a sort of general effect. So somebody just says, um, you know, but sometimes surveys are flawed, right? That sort of thought ought to let you distrust all surveys in general. But what we have in this case is something quite different. Somebody said, this survey was flawed, right? That's very particular evidence about this survey, and it doesn't seem to generalize in the same way as a doubt does. So it seems to me that it's important philosophically to, to distinguish defeat from doubt. That's uh, been a sort of important insight in uh, recent epistemology. And indeed, you can see that defeat and doubt have these different kinds of uh, effect, which mean we shouldn't push them together. I mean, another kind of worry about the contextual solution I haven't got on this slide is that, I mean, again, this connects to general debates about contextualism, but I mean, one of the things that, you know, we, we, when we realize the highly interconnected nature of inquiry, we want to, it to be the case that people who are generating evidence in different locations can all kind of put that all together, right? But if we allow the word evidence to change its meaning between contexts, it's going to be much harder to do that kind of all getting together thing, right? Because maybe they say it's part of the evidence that P, but they're using evidence in a different way than I am, right? So once we sort of think about the kind of social nature of inquiry, I think it's, it's much better if we don't have this kind of shifty view on which what you know, each group means by evidence is a different thing, right? That's the whole reason why I take it that in science you have established practices for saying when something is decent evidence, right? To allow, so we don't allow this kind of thing. All right, so 
I've sort of initially talked about our problem and have more or less gone through all the possible options, um, apart from this option, which is my favorite option, which is to suggest that evidence can be lost. Right. So this is going to be an invariantist solution. We won't need to have any of this shiftiness about evidence. And we might think that even quite independently of the puzzle we've been thinking about, we obviously lose evidence. I mean, we forget stuff. I mean, books got burnt and, you know, we lose evidence. That's just an unfortunate part of life. So once we realize that, we might think, well, you know, the Bayesian framework, which seems to assume that, you know, evidence is never lost, isn't quite right anyway. We're going to have to uh, change that. Um, and so the thought would be that initially it was part of my evidence that most intend to vote yes. But then when I get the information that the survey on which that was based was flawed, then I lose that evidence, right? It's not because of a change in the meaning of the word evidence. I just lost the evidence. Um, notice that uh, this kind of approach will allow us to model two different kinds of defeat differently, defeat of evidence and defeat of justification provided by evidence. But I think that's fine because they seem to me to be kind of different um, phenomena. And also notice that if we're comparing this with a contextualist solution, then the contextualist also treats those differently. The contextualist only invokes a difference in uh, the meaning of the word evidence for one kind of defeat. Sometimes they think defeat can be modeled without such a change, but sometimes they think it has to be modeled with such a change. So that's not really a reason to prefer one view or the other. Of course, it's also true that what I'm doing here is to, in the talking about loss of evidence, is if you like talking about an outside the model or extra model solution. Right? I mean, this is no longer, the solution is not within the Bayesian framework anymore. I'm just saying, uh, you know, there's a loss of evidence. Um, but, you know, here's one reason not to feel so uncomfortable about that, which would be to think that, you know, any Bayesian model is going to need supplementing with some account of evidence, right? That's a sort of philosophical question. What's the nature of evidence? What the Bayesian framework does is to basically tell you what moves you ought to be making given your evidence and prior probabilities. But that needs supplementing with a philosophical account of evidence, so that's sort of going to be true anyway. In another, and also just to sort of uh, compare it also to the contextualist solution, in a sense, both of them are going for extra model accounts of this phenomenon. For the contextualist, all the work was in the off model semantics for the word evidence, whereas I'm saying it's all in the off model account of the nature of evidence, so there's nothing to choose between them on that front either. Um, OK, so just to sort of pull back on uh, to the conclusion and to the bigger picture, there have been many recent attacks on revisionary defeat. I've just focused on one of them, but we could also talk about other ones in Q&A, which is the kind of worry about defeat of evidence from a Bayesian view viewpoint. And I've said that in the light of these worries, we really should not reject revisionary defeat of evidence, which would be some people's reaction, because I think that's going to um, lead you to have to give up on a contributory notion, which is disastrous. So then we just have to talk about how to accommodate this kind of defeat of evidence within a Bayesian framework. And I've suggested the best way to do that is to allow for loss of evidence. OK, thanks very much. So I guess one, one way in which invariance is positioned sometimes develops is by trying to exploit the features of broadly contextualist accounts to serve as triggers for loss. So right. So, so you might expect a kind of extension of the Greco style account where what, what happens is there's a demand on evidence, yeah. which is something like you know it or you don't doubt it. And then what happens in these three cases is that doubt is induced or, or in one or another way one comes to lose the knowledge. Yeah. Uh, and that's why the evidence drops away. Is that the kind of... Okay, right. So um, on any account on... I mean, here we've been talking about propositional evidence, right? And um, on most accounts, uh, some proposition gets to be part of your evidence uh, because you've got a certain epistemic standing with respect to it. I mean, otherwise we'd have to be sort of profligate, as it were, about evidence, saying, well, anything you believe for any old bad reason was part of your evidence. We don't want to go that way. So we better have some epistemic standing required. And so it might be justified belief or justified true belief or knowledge, whatever. And as soon as you have that kind of epistemic condition on a proposition as being part of your evidence, then one way in which this mechanism of loss can work is you lost that epistemic standing. Right? To do that, we don't have to go contextualist, although, of course, you could do it in a contextualist way. But then you kind of wonder why you didn't do it earlier in the way that Dan Greco did. I mean, that wasn't the suggestion. Right. The suggestion was to exploit the materials from the text. 
to, right. to say more about precisely what mechanisms involved in losing right. systemic standards. Um, the so I guess the reason I wouldn't want to uh, go for a contextualist version of this is the kind of explained by the stuff I said about the difference between defeat and doubt. So your basic contextualist framework says you lose epistemic standing, or that's a misspeaking really, <laughs> it's no longer true for you to claim a certain epistemic standing, um, and the basic mechanisms are either stakes or doubt, psychological doubt. But here um, what we've got is positive reason to doubt, and part of my earlier argument was we should just distinguish that from psychological doubt, which is why I wouldn't want to reach into the contextualist book of toys to, to deal with this, um, and instead would want to say even within a fixed invariantist notion of justification or knowledge required for evidence, that can be lost because of con contrary evidence. That would be the idea. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the talk. I, I just have, it might just be a clar clarification question. Um, so I was a little bit lost about uh, how you're using justification, and you might think there's between the face yep. justification, there's um, having some justification, and okay. there's overall justification. Yep. And maybe one way to make three and four consistent would be uh, if a T2, you have, you have evidence of so yep. him, then at T2, you have some justification to believe okay. yes, and at four, you're not overall. Okay. So, so here's why I wasn't thinking of that kind of solution. Um, I mean, the setup of the case initially is that um, I read in the paper that, <coughs> excuse me, most intend to vote yes, and then we're assuming that actually, I mean, it was, this is sort of a, implicit in the way I described it, that we're assuming that intentions are a really pretty good guide to behavior, right? And so in other words, I would get pretty strong or high justification to believe in the initial description of the case, right? Now, I mean, if you don't think that intentions are such a good guide to behavior, it doesn't really matter. Just re-describe the case so that that's true, right? Because, I mean, the case is supposed to be described so that, we're supposed to set things up so that initially, given the evidence I have, I've, I have got justification to believe some proposition P. Right? So wherever you, whatever you think's n required, like if you've got a high threshold, doesn't really matter, just there set things up, well. set things up so that that's the case, right? And then, um, what we want to say is that at the later time, uh, you don't have that. Um, and the thing you were suggesting was that at three, you wouldn't have that high level, but you'd have kind of some justification to believe. Um, the thought would be, so how's that, how's that supposed to work? How are you supposed to get that result at three, which is most, most supposed to make all these propositions consistent? So the, my question would be this. Um, when we get the information that some particular survey sometime was flawed, it doesn't look as if we've got much evidence against the general connection between attention and behavior. Right? But if at T2, it's part of my evidence that they intend to vote yes, and if in general intention is a good guide to behavior, then it looks as if you would not just have some justification to believe here or prima facie, you'd have like all things considered justification to believe, even where you're assuming that it involves a kind of exceeding some high threshold. Um, just because the information that some survey is flawed just doesn't seem to tell against the general connection between, uh, about, between intentions and behavior. Right? Um, so that's why I'm thinking that there wouldn't be any easy way to um, get a resolution on which three just talks about prima facie or some justification. So that's why I was thinking that wouldn't be available to us. So I'm wondering uh, about a way to solve the puzzle uh, that utilizes the distinction Michael Bergman has made between having uh, reasons or having evidence okay. and those reasons having the capacity to justify. Okay. So here's the thought. Um, uh, as long as you could have reasons who lose their capacity to justify, yeah. what, uh, what you could say about uh, cases like this is that the subject keeps the evidence, but they don't yeah. lose the evidence. It's just that the evidence loses its capacity to justify. Right. Uh, but by hanging on to the first, um, you're not forced to deny that Bayesian mm -hmm. assumption, but you might be right. forced to deny three. That seems to me to be a little bit similar to what we were just talking about here. Um, so if we start out with the thought that there's a high, um, so that, um, 
given they intend to vote yes, or look at the, sorry, the, prob the probability conditional on that they vote, intend to vote yes of yes is high, right? That's like the initial description of the case. In other words, that intentions are a good guide to behavior, right? If we start out with that, uh, and you still have the evidence, how could it be that it's lost its power to justify when that's still in place? Because we haven't been given any good reason to suppose that intentions aren't a good guide to behavior. So I think that, I mean, although it's an interesting distinction, um, I'm not sure that it helps yet because we still need an account of how it lost its justificatory power given that conditional probability, right? That's the issue. Um, and it, I mean, sort of nicely when, um, Weisberg gives a sort of generalization of this problem. He puts it in terms of rigidity, sort of saying that on, even on a Jeffrey view, you don't revise those conditional probabilities when the new evidence comes in. They're kind of still in place. And that's, right, so this is all why, it's sort of a generalization of why looking at three doesn't really help. Um. Uh, I mean, thank you, I think your diagnosis is uh, exactly right. Just two quick questions. So your objection to the contextualist view Instead of, it seems to me as if you had very specific information about this particular survey yeah. flaws. So it wasn't this completely ungrounded yeah. skepticism about the exactly. kind of survey. So, but then you might think that information could ground some sort of mental state defeat. I mean, some people well just think there is such a notion. So that would be a kind of defeat as opposed to doubt. So you would actually have two types of, of, of defeat. Um, so just explain to me what you mean by mental state. So what, I lose well, belief you know, or something? Or? Have, if you give, give them information like so that, because some mental state of yours, they will feed or undermine your, your justification of it. Right. Um, As a, uh, so is the contrast with like some fact I don't know about? Yeah. yeah. OK, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the way I've said it's it. Something, it could be something that you hold irrationally, or just the fact, the fact that you're in that state would suffice to undermine. Right. Yeah, that's one, okay. one question. The other question I had was about, I mean, uh, yeah. So um, instead of the contextual response, you could have a kind of relative response where you would think okay. of the the uh, evidence has been relative to a state of information. So to resolve the, the tension that way, so in the first kind is you have evidence relative to, to one word, you know, state of information, and then you enlarge on that once you've been told that this particular survey is flawed. So, but then relative to this, this, uh, this enlarged <coughs> information, you don't actually have right. evidence. So you wouldn't be justified in believing the proposition on the basis of that evidence. So that's the side of it. It's not actually, so it's not as if evidence is a, it's a contextual it's notion, except yeah. a notion of, being relative to a state of, state of information. Okay, so um, so on the second thing, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I should think a bit more about relativism. I mean, usually wherever there's a contextual solution, there's a relativist solution. Yeah, um, I would have thought the most the thing to go for though for the relativist would be like a sort of change of standard, roughly speaking, right? I mean, which is the thing that's most analogous to the contextualist, whereas. You're going to a kind of relatively relativity to information state, now, but if we haven't changed the standard, it seems to me the remarks I was making about three come back in again, right? So, if all that happened was I started out with the new, you know, the thing from the newspaper, so most intend to vote yes, and we add in, you know, the information state gets enriched with survey was flawed, but then it's just a rerun of the same problem, right? What we need is, I mean, the whole. So one way to to, to understand the problem is that. On the Bayesian framework, defeat is supposed to happen by the accumulation of evidence. I never lose anything, I just get more. Right? And the problem is we can't see how I lost the justification when we just add the more in, even though intuitively we think it's lost. Right? So if the relativism is a relativism to information state or evidence which is changing, then my worry is that that result still holds. So I'm thinking the relativist would be better to go uh, unless, unless, OK, so maybe you were thinking it was a loss view. Um, so then it becomes, so that would be the only way to do it. So yeah. you're thinking of a loss view. Yeah. Maybe. So, okay, so if it's, um, if it's, okay, so if it's just a loss view, then I'm just taking it the kinds of things I said about the distinction between defeat and doubt reapply. So sorry, I was sort of a long while until I realized what you were suggesting. Okay, but, so then yeah. I get back to the first worry I had about it. It didn't seem as if there was sort of an unfounded general doubt. Like yeah, like indeed. Like, indeed. I completely agree. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I've got a, a probably fairly basic question of clarification. I want something I didn't quite get about the example. So uh, consider an alternative example. Forget yeah. about uh, flaw. Uh, instead, take um, the proposition <coughs> there is strong evidence that most people in the polling booth actually change their mind and vote in line with what the murder press is telling them. Right. Okay. So that's uh, an undercutting defeater in the classical sense. 
In that case, we have the fact that people intend to vote yes, and then in the light of the fact that uh, there is evidence that they, people tend to change their minds, the significance of that first piece of evidence is undermined. I mean, the, the fact, it's still a fact that they intend this now, but it, it's no longer a good reason to predict that they will vote yes. So that's how um, I understand the, the intuitive and, and sort of, I mean, the way undercutting evidence is used. Um, in your example, it's not undercutting evidence in that sense. Um, it's more, I mean, I, I think in the end, I probably completely agree with your, I mean, I guess I would have thought, what we want to say intuitively about your yeah. story is, well, it's not undercutting evidence, or what I want to say intuitively, it's removing evidence. Right, <laughs> okay. It's, it's, it's not, it doesn't undercut the significance of the fact that they intend to vote yes. It's undercutting your ability to know that fact. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I, th I think probably we, we shouldn't focus too much on the, the terminology of undercutting, undermining. I mean, I was using it so that basically we talk about that kind of defeat when we've got reason to think that uh, some source isn't a kind of good, good thing to base beliefs on. Right? And, and even in your example, I'm thinking that, so we got this information about their intentions. Nobody's suggesting that wasn't a good way of getting information about their intentions. It's just that. They're going to they're going to change their intentions, right? And something can be a good source of information about my intentions at one point, even though I'm now being told that there's reason to suppose those intentions will change, right? So that's why, as, as a matter of fact, I, I was wasn't wouldn't be thinking that was a case of undermining, but that's just sort of a matter of terminology, really. Um, but um, and I think that first kind of case the Bayesian can deal with because they can just because they can deal with this on an accumulative model. Well, there's this bit of evidence about what they intended to do at T1, and now we get some evidence they will change it by the time the crucial thing happens, right, or something. And then you, you add all this stuff together and you get the defeat. The problem only comes in when the additive model or cumulative model can't be applied. And so then we have to do something else. We have to give up on defeat. We have to say there's evidence loss. Or it sounds if you were sort of happy with that. Or we've got to go contextualist or Right? I mean, that's, that's where the problem comes. Um, so I'm not really sure we're disagreeing, um, except about the terminology and, yeah. Front row. Oh, yes, you uh, Hi, um, I'm a psychologist, so sure. this is sort of uh, new territory for me. Um, so I'm still sort of getting my head around it. Um, I'm wondering how you would deal with a possible alternative case, how you would uh, okay. classify it in a Bayesian theme or, or yeah. applying your particular understanding. So let's suppose that I want to know if I should drink coffee. Yeah. I think that it's good or bad for my health. Yeah. So uh, if a study comes along and it shows on average yeah. uh, it's good for health. Okay. But then it turns out that it's really good for health if you're female, but a little bit bad for health if you're male. Yeah. But since I'm male, I should drink coffee. Right. So at stage one, you have evidence that yeah. Good stage two, uh, not for me. Yeah. Yeah. Still <coughs> yeah. So how would you find a framework there? It seems, uh, maybe it doesn't create a problem for Bayesian. That's what I'm thinking. You don't think that it's not true. So the, the idea is there isn't a. Just, it just seems like, just like this case, the new evidence completely, I don't know, it just completely wipes out the original evidence. Well, it it's doesn't. moderator, right? Well. I was thinking that the average claim could still be true if we set it all up right, whatever, right? So in that sense, it, um, you can add together, or on average, it's good, plus, <coughs> but it's not good for some small category, and the average is because of its effect on other people. Like, those two things aren't inconsistent, right? I mean, suppose there's more women than men in the population or something, or right? So, so it could still be good on average, but not good for you because you're in a smaller part. And those aren't, you can just add that stuff together and then we can see the effect on your justification. So that seems to me a case in which we can accumulate evidence together and get the effect we want. Whereas the problems I'm talking about come from cases in which you know, accumulating it, adding one bit to another, still doesn't get us the result we want, right? And, and so that's really what I'm trying to talk about here. So the case, the interesting case you brought up, I think can be handled, yeah, yeah. I'll try to keep it quick. Um, I haven't read Dan's paper yet, but um, I'm just wondering, normally when we think about contextual terminology, we think there's some hidden variable in the context. Okay. Some, yeah. Um, 
constituent to the content, and that you can make that explicit, and that's somehow some evidence that this is like tall for a fifth grader versus tall for a basketball yeah. player. We can make it explicit. What's the what's the <laughs> constituent that's being contributed by context such that we can make it explicit across context? I mean, I, I mean, I, he doesn't say anything about the semantics, um, and of course, it's a well-known problem as you know, which is supposed to be the semantic model, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, maybe you could have a standards variable for what counts as evidence, in the same way as some people think there's a standards variable for knowledge. Um, but I mean, in a sense, that's kind of the problem for my opposition, if you see what I mean. And actually, Dan doesn't say anything about the semantic modeling in, in the paper. He's just like, well, let's 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 look for a contextual solution. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Right, let's thank Jessica for well, the thank you. Thank you.